Hi, and welcome to Comic-Con at Home. This is the Overstreet 50th anniversary party. I'm JC Vaughn, Vice President of Publishing for Gemstone Publishing, the home of the Overstreet Comic Book Price Guide. And I would like our panel to introduce themselves, starting with Maggie. Hi, I'm Maggie Thompson. I started collecting comic books when I was four, and I just never quit. And uh, co-edited a magazine newspaper called Comic Spires Guide for three decades. And now I do freelance material and continue to collect. Mr. Borak. Hi, my name is Steve Borok. I'm president and founder of CBCS, um, Comic Book Grading uh, Certification Services. And um, I've been a hobbyist all my life. Uh, just uh, really honored to be on a panel with everybody. Buddy? Buddy Saunders. Um, I own Lone Star Comics. Uh, we do business on the internet as my comic shop. Uh, I didn't get in, didn't start reading comics as quite as quick as Maggie. It was 1961 when I started reading, and that was before there were any Marvel characters. Jack Kirby and Kirby and Ayers were doing the monster books with the Ditko backups, and I still love those things. And uh, comics are what's keep what keeps me young, and I think it what it keeps a lot of us young. Thank you, Mark. I'm Mark Huseman. I'm creative director at Gemstone, and I do all the pricing changes and updates for the guide, as well as design the articles, pretty much everything that the other people don't do. And uh, <laughs> waiting to get this this new number 50 done. It's got it in the holding pattern. It's It, it will be done soon, so everyone can uh, enjoy it. Thank you, Mark. And last but not least, Steve. Hello, I'm Steve Jeppe. I am first and foremost a collector, always have been, always will be, and started collecting comics when I was five years old. I got exposed to comics when I was five years old, read a Batman comic. I've never been the same since. Some will say that's for the good and some will say not so, but uh, I own Diamond Comic Distributors, Gemstone Publishing, and a bunch of other stuff that's related to the comic book industry. And uh, at a ripe young age of 70 years old, I'm as committed and as impassioned by it as ever. And I'm loving the fact that I'm on this panel with you guys because I get to talk about my first love, which is the comic books themselves. Yes. All right, Steve, we'll start with you and say, how did you first hear about the Overstreet Comic Book Press Guide? Well, was, I try to remember exactly how I heard about it, but I remember the first one I bought was number three, the green cover. And uh, what happened was I, famous story, but I know, so I won't go into, but I yeah. was reading, I uh, was in Ocean, Wildwood, New Jersey, and my nephew was reading the comic book, got a flashback, decided when I got back, I'd look oh, into it, sure. started to accumulate some comics, and somewhere along the line, I must have saw a house ad, or wherever I saw it, maybe it was the buyer's guide, I don't know, I saw an ad for the Overstreet comic book price guy, but I, when I got into it, I had no clue about value, I was just getting them because I remembered them, and I loved them, so I bought an Overstreet price guide number three, and here we are on the eve of number 50, and I've now owned it the same amount of time as Bob has, because yeah. I think it was number 25 was my first guide. And uh, here we are 25 more years later. The guide is going strong. Uh, we got a lot of plans for it, by the way, and uh, technology is forcing a lot of that. But uh, under the wonderful stewardship of uh, Jeff Vaughn and, and, and Mark, and of course, Bob himself, which I wish he was on here, I've been blessed to own and I consider it a sacred trust to own it. It's not like my guide in the sense I have the responsibility, whether it makes money or loses money. So I get the benefit or the negativity, but it was never about that. And uh, ironically, despite the fact when I think by now it's been proven, people thought, Oh my God, Jeffy's buying the price guy. Let's check him. I had guys actually admit to me, they would follow books that they knew I bought to see what would happen next year. <laughs> if I was putting prices up through the roof. And one of my, he's now deceased now, one of my off critic friends uh, said to me one day, you know, for years I was following that Wiz Comics number one. I knew you had the mile high copy and never could hardly ever go up. But yeah, I was pissed about that myself. <laughs> so, but, but I really had no involvement. And to be quite frank about it, my eyesight, <laughs> you, that, you want to know why you have a, a, a big, big price guy? Jeff will tell you it's because I couldn't see the other one. So, so I did that for me, but it turned out to be a great workbook for people too. That's absolutely the case. I do want to. I do want to say you've actually owned it now longer than Bob. Yeah, you're, technically, you're, yeah, I had, it was 40, 48, 48 was the first one that you that that you had owned it the same amount of years, and all, that's also the only time your name has ever appeared on the cover. Really, I didn't even yeah. notice that. 
Yeah, we snuck <laughs> we snuck you into the credits on the Planet of the Apes style cover. I never even seen it. I have to go back. Which one's that on? 48? 48. 48. On the big book or the regular edition? Uh, the the regular edition, both the soft cover and hard cover. I feel like Carl Barks. He snuck his name in. I think it's uh, Walt Disney's uh, Comics and Stories number 78 with a sideway box here and it says Barks. And it was one panel in one of the Comics and Stories where it's Bark Soup on the shelf. And I didn't, but I didn't do it myself. He did it. So Very nice. All right. Maggie. I've been memorialized. Maggie, same question for you. How did you first hear about the guide? Well, I watched Jerry Bales go through boxes at a Detroit convention, trying to find out what the issue numbers were and what the dealers were charging. And I said, Man, you know, I mean, that was exciting because just what, just what Steve Jebby said was we didn't know what was there. We wanted to know what was there. To me, what's important is not how much is something getting. I mean, I need to know that I'm not being cheated if I spend too much in quotes, but what I want to know is how many copies were there. So Steve Canyon was canceled by Harvey, but they had run a cover image for the next issue. So that was on people's want list for years, but we knew that that next issue had never come out because Don had had a subscription and they fulfilled the subscription of Steve Canyon with Sad Sack. But unless you'd been doing it and obsessing on it, you didn't have that information. And the information starting here, that was what it was for. There's two other examples of that, Maggie, and they both happened to be Harvey. Flash Gordon number five, I believe, was advertised and never came out. And Boy Explorers number three. Yep. So people have yeah. been, well, not for a price guide, they would be still looking for them and thinking they might exist. Exactly. All right, buddy, it's your, your turn with that question. When did you first hear about the guide? Well, I, you know, I was selling comic books uh, well into that because, well, I have, a, I have a full page ad in the first guide. So I knew about it before it came out and probably learned about it through one of the fanzines because I've, I've got, you know, a five drawer, big five drawer filing cabinet full of fanzines from the period. So I'm sure it was through somebody's fanzine. And that makes a lot of sense. How about you, Mr. Borok? Um, my, I did not get the first few copies. <laughs> um, my first copy I picked up was the Tarzan cover. It was so cool. And my father yelled at me for spending so much money in my comic book money on something that was more expensive than a comic book. <laughs> but um, I mean, the minute I saw it, it, I, it just opened up a whole new world to me. It was fantastic. Mark, what about you? Uh, my first one was number 23, but way back in 1974, my parents got this bootleg thing yeah. from uh, that guy. I don't know if anyone knows him. <laughs> What's his name? Who is that? It's Hal L. Cohen. He did a lot of other price guides back in the early 70s. So, I... uh, yeah, so I had this. I think my mother bought it for me, probably. But then uh, I got a real overstreet when I saw the Infantino cover because I was collecting Silver Age Flash issues when I started collecting around 75, 76 from Steve's store. So that that uh, version of Flash was always appealing to me. So I had to grab that one instead of just thumbing through it in the bookstore. The first one I saw was number six with the spirit cover on it. And it was... Uh, it was 1976. I was very into the Bicentennial. And here came a, a character I didn't know yet, but uh, with, a, with a riff on, the, uh, on, the, on the, the revolution. And I thought it was really cool. And there was no way I was going to spend my comic money uh, for like three weeks <laughs> and buy a book and, not, and then not have any new comics. So uh, I very quickly after that uh, saw number five, the same one as you, Steve, and and just fell in love with that Kubrick cover. And I think the first one I actually bought was number eight. And my best friend and I would trade off years so we wouldn't destroy our comic budgets at the same time. Uh, I, I, and visual aid. Yes, that's Buddy's ad. There, there you go. go. Boy, we got a lot of business off that too. <laughs> Can I quote you? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> there you go. 
Well, I think it's, we I think it's been selling buddy, comics for buddies since 1970. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think that the fact that we are talking about a book that has been around for five decades and a guy who advertised in the second printing of number one is our back cover advertiser. Hey. I mean, is that, a, is that just an amazing thing to be able to say or what? 50 years is a long time to be any business to still be alive. And when you consider what's happened in those 50 years, how many monster companies have went out of business, uh, it says a lot. Uh, not, I don't, like I said, I own the price cap, but I don't look at it that way. I think it's the industry's guide and it just happened to be under my stewardship, which I have almost virtually anything to do with. So Jeff and Mark and Bob do all the heavy lifting and, and it's a few other people. But by and large, anybody that has any business that lasts 50 years has accomplished something. And it's a great celebration this year. We're excited about it. It really, it really is. And I think that being able to do this uh, virtual panel, it, it, a little bit makes up for not being able to celebrate it in person. So next year, we'll do 50 plus one and do it like it's number 50. And, and we'll, have a, we'll have a good time with that. Uh, next question is going to be, what do you think the guide's impact has been? And Steve Borak, let's start with you. Well, the biggest impact for me, um, and the thing I enjoy most about it, I mean, it, I always said it was like Christmas morning getting the guide, right? <laughs> it was, but for me, it was better. <laughs> it was just like, I could go through it, look at the ads, look at all the prices, what went up, what didn't, I had a great time. But what really uh, means uh, a lot to me about the guide is a sense of community. And I wouldn't have the friends that are on this panel right now if it wasn't for the price guide. Um, and with Bob putting all the advisors together and constantly evolving, mm -hmm. it's become this incredible community that we all love and we all um, live for. Uh, so to me, the, the, one of the best things Bob ever did was bring our community together. I think that's a, that's a great answer. Maggie, what about you? Well, I'm in the interesting position of having had to do our own price guide in competition with Bob. And that was, we never wanted to do that. We wanted to do the newspaper and the company said, well, we do price guides for coins and price guides for trading cards. So you need to do a price guide for comics. We're good. There is a price guide for comics already. They go, no, no, we need to do one. So we were, we tried to work in fact, we had a newsstand publication, a newsstand magazine for a while called Comics Collector. And we wanted to give that information to people. If we do an article about something, we want prices on it. And we contacted Bob and he gave us permission. And I think issue number two, where we would do an article and then it would be from Bob's price guide would be the prices. <laughs> and then he thought better of it very wisely. And so we were stuck with doing it. And it is by the way, pain in the butt to do the prices, to do all that stuff, to do the work that Mark's doing. No, because I want to talk about the covers and how cool they are. And by the way, let's get past the covers and look at the splash pages. That's what I want to talk about. Um, and yet the flip side to that, the, the cooperation in the industry has been tremendous. So for example, I remember when we were doing Comics Collector, Bob was doing the price, the, the official price guide and other people were copying Bob. I'm back. I'm back. And he took me aside and I think it was uh, in Oakland maybe. Uh, and he said, look, people are ripping us off. How are we gonna handle that? So we were working together on making sure that we did our own research separately. We could differ, whatever, but it was, it was totally professional, totally responsible, and completely honest. And the fact that that was how it was handled on both sides from the start, just, is there a parallel anywhere else in the collecting world? I, I don't think so. I think that's a really good point, Maggie. Uh, one of the things that is sort of unique and it is unique in my experience, uh, is that any of the other areas that I collect, the price guide author is a dealer of some kind. And you guys came at it from fans and news purveyors, and Bob was a collector and you know somebody disseminating the information. And I think that comics was really blessed to have that be the, uh, the way that it came about. 
Uh, buddy, what do you what do you think about that? What do you think the guide's impact has been? Well, it's for me, it's a double impact. First, as a as a comic book retailer, because it it you know it codified prices. It was you know some people forget that it's a guide. It's not a you know it the numbers That's are not set in stone, but it you know it it's it's a good touchstone for everything. But I I liked it too, just as a fan, because like all of us. Uh, it's fascinating just to learn more and more about the history of comics. You know, we're working on on, our, on my website. I've I've spent thousands and thousands of dollars, and still we still are on trying to get write ups on the on everything we put up. You know, and Overstreet was you know kind of the backdrop for that, the beginning. And so it's I mean it's probably influenced and. You know, there's not a comic collector that can call himself a comic collector that that hasn't been using a guide for as many years as basically they were old enough to afford it. Because I, I never occurred to me that younger fans couldn't necessarily afford it and not get their regular comics at the same time. Steve, how about you? What do you think the uh, what do you think the lasting impact of the guide is? Well, I think starting with me, not the guy who owns it, but me, the guy who bought it with number three and has been loyal to it ever since. I think the words that the most impactful thing is kind of hard to get. They kind of consistent with who I am. It's the common denominator. And by that, I mean, on a lot of levels, first of all, all these companies compete, all the different Marvel, DC, Dark World, yet they all have to be in this one book. That's something they can't avoid. It's, it's a common denominator. And quite frankly, even now in the, with the age of slabbing uh, and, and pricing being so volatile, uh, I kind of look at the, and I think it's the only way to look at that is the price guide is the denominator, meaning you might charge one and a half times guide, you might charge three times guide, you, but it's always the guide that represents the denominator. And that makes it better for us. So when we switched the price guide to limit it to 9.2 at the top price, what we were really saying is 9.4 and 9.6 aren't something we could even begin to quantify because they're so volatile. So, and yeah. on even nine two, there could be books sold for more or less, but by and large, a common denominator. And when I say it's consistent with who I am, I'm a distributor. I get happy about everybody's product, you know? <laughs> so, cause I'm in the middle, they might all compete with one another, but they all come through us. And so it's a great thing. And, and likewise, another extension to that, Baltimore Magazine, which is totally off the charts as far as the comic industry is concerned. And what I call my coming out party in 1993, when I won this entrepreneur year, and people finally knew who the heck I was in Baltimore. They didn't know they had a big distributor in comics. So I got to thinking about it. When the opportunity came up, aside from being a privilege to own the city magazine, I thought, this is the common denominator. I got all these people that, unless they have a comic store, they can't do any business with me. You know, they're not going to be able to interact with me. But by owning the magazine, I could do charitable ads. I could do PSAs. I could sell them advertising. And so I guess that's, I was born to be the middleman. <laughs> Maybe that's my new superhero title, that's middleman. So great. That's great. Born <laughs> to be the middleman. Isn't that, wow. Okay. And think about it. Everybody's always trying to eliminate the middleman. So I have to be some sort of <laughs> superhero or villain in somebody's mind. <laughs> or glutton for punishment. There you go. But that, it, right. it, impact is an undeniable. And I can say that objectively, because I would have said that before I bought it. Uh, it's the only book I know in all of collectibles that you say the guide and no one says which one per se, you know, it's, it's just accepted. And uh, that's a stewardess stewardship that I've honored and felt responsible for because the guide will be around long after I'm gone. And I want it to always be revered away. And God, how can we have a conversation about this without tipping our hat to Bob and the incredible research. Here's a guy that loved EC comics. He loved flying saucers. Have you ever talked to Bob? He was fascinated with that. And his, and his, uh, uh, points, you know, the, the art artifacts that he would treasure. Whatever Bob does, he goes at it 1,000%, and he is dedicated. I mean, he goes to the most microscopic, I don't care what it was, if you wrote, and when I bought the price guide, I've never gotten around, I'll probably not live long enough to go around this, but when I got all the paperwork, Bob had a box of correspondence for each price guide, and it represented, and it's, you're probably in that box, because if you wrote Bob on any reason to give a correction or to a suggestion, Bob has that in a box. So I have like number 26, 27, and, and even previous. And I've never gotten around to do it, but he genuinely looked at all the research because he wanted to know 
So the impact has a great deal has to give it because other people, SFCA, there were other price guys. And with due respect, they all did a great job, Maggie's included. But Bob was kind of the first guy to really, and, and another guy is Ernie Gerber, who I always wanted that book. I can almost take credit for giving him the idea humbly, but I just can't imagine anybody else having the wherewithal all the time to go fly around the country and photograph as efficiently it did all those comics. So two things there that price got and they go hand in hand and um, long answer, but very impactful. Mark, you have a uh, slightly different seat than most of us in that you interact with all of the advisors every year. You're the person who is receiving all the mark reports and collating them for Bob. You hear from these guys during the year, fixing up their ads, doing all this other stuff. What do you think, what do you think the impact of the guide has been? Like the others were saying, it's the community and we're not like, or the, the various dealers aren't rivals. I guess a good example would be when John Verzel passed away and all the people that came to Dallas to pay tribute to him and you'd, you'd have, you know, the, the big rivals, but they were all great friends. I think that's something you do see play out with that. Um, what about in terms, uh, Mark, in, in terms of its lasting impact uh, as, as do you see it just as the thing that brings people together or do you, do you, will you see something more? I guess besides the pricing, there's all of the, information, the uh, starting dates and and uh, various info on particular issues, all the stuff that I have to look out for <laughs> over the years. So I don't know how many hundreds of pages of that book is just my my keystrokes from over the years. I, so I think I'm always trying to keep it accurate and keep it real. I know Bob had set some traps for uh, for people copying the information and he never gave me the list. So, <laughs> so people would write it and say, this is wrong. And then I would research and I'm thinking, why would Bob put something inaccurate like that in the guide? And so apparently it was probably on his trap list. But, you know, I never got it. So maybe someday I'll be presented at, the, uh, at next year's San Diego Con. You can have a big ceremony. You know, to your to your thought there, uh, Mark. Uh, I'm sorry, Mag. You want to go first? Yeah, I I just wanted to say we didn't agree with that. So the way we protected ours was we put unimportant information in. Mm. So it was like you know, here's this pencil or you never heard of that we would put. So you would know that if somebody stole it from ours, but we never put inaccurate. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and 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 I think part of where Bob's reasoning back then. I remember there was company uh, House of Collectibles. Yes, and they had offend, or infringed on Bob blatantly, and he, and that was a lawsuit. Yes, it, it got solved, but at the end of the day, they had a reason. But when I, I'm unrelated, but I mentioned on when you talk about all the monster size of this thing now and all the information, you go you can go hundreds of pages before you get the first listing. Now it's had so much stuff in there; it's become more of a book than it is anything else. But it was, and we'll all relate to this, and maybe it still holds the rain. Maybe it still holds the record, but. Classic comics used to be of an, an anomaly because there were so many printings, you had to devote multiple pages. Well, now, if you ever look up Batman, <laughs> how many pages you got to have just to cover Batman? There's so many trade paperbacks. And Mark, a tip of the hat to you. I don't know how you keep up with it. It's just well, we so can't much. even. We can't do all the variants. I mean, sometimes you'll have 30 variants for a number one issue. We just can't list that. One in the of the guide. things I think if that will be a what if <laughs> dear lord if we ever get this thing digitized like we've been trying for so long it'll give you the ability to not be restricted by size that's why the print's so small so many pages and typically someone doing this for for, for profit would never justify all that information in there they would just give you some prices and general facility uh, uh, they would have their author du jour who would do comics one week and watches the next and just give them enough information to give them a quote guide but if we get this or I should say quick myself when we and get this digitized, thank you we will have the luxury of the internet being us unlimited and i would love to then include what's always been a itch in somebody's crawl called the undergrounds because they're really totally something that should be in there because they're no different than an independent today we call it i mean yeah. i would imagine there still has to be some 
reasonable approach to with two kids in college with a roll of toilet paper, draw two stick men and say, this is my comic. We might have to draw the line somewhere with a, at the risk of sounding like a censor, we might have to have some criteria for people to be considered a legitimate published comic, some circulation, something. But now you got things like online only comics and uh, you know digital. So I don't know how you quantify that, but but it's clear one thing: print can't handle it forever. We'll have a five thousand page print. It's going to be like the encyclopedia one day at, at the rate we're going. That, that's the good thing though too, because we keep finding new information now. Steve, Not to mention when, a million new comics are published every year. Steve, when did you first meet Bob, and what were the circumstances? I remember how awe-inspired I was. I was I've been listed as an advisor since number six. And that was my badge of honor. I could tell the world that in this bigger world and the little comic shop in Baltimore and Vincent Avenue, I was an advisor to the Overstreet Price Guide. And I can't recall the exact year it was obviously pre that, but Bob, and Bob, you gotta remember, Bob was an avid buyer. He was a customer. I sold Bob the very collection I bought back from him when I bought his uh, company. A great number of those were books I sold Bob. So Bob, with his voracious appetite to buy everything well, had become a, somewhere in those seventies in those early seventies, he had become a buyer, one of my customers. And I had developed a little reputation for being a golden age dealer. So it was, but when he first time I ever got to talk to him, I remember being in the basement of my TV repair shop on my phone and here I'm talking to Bob freaking Overstreet. This is the coolest thing ever. And he's actually listening to me and he's taking some of my advice. I, uh, there's a section in the price guy comics with little, if any value, and I remember Bob latching onto my description of that when I had said, you know, at the time, I think comics were 75 cents or something like that. I said, Bob, when a comic store sells a comic book for a dollar fifty that came out last month at 75 cents, we're not trying to imply to the collector that if he goes adds up his 10,000 comics, that he's got a $15,000 collection. But what that represents is the available price. In other words, you missed last month's issue. But for me to provide that service, I got to bag it, I got to price it, I got to put it out and make it available to you. You probably would spend more money running from 7-Eleven to 7-Eleven in gas, trying to save those 75 cents and finding it, and you may never find the cover price. But the comic store is saying, look, here it is. You missed it, but we kind of try to keep it in stock, you know, uh, in perpetuity if we could. And thereby, it's not really, now some things end up being worth money, but it's right, because unfortunately, you don't want the guide to imply, and that happens all the time. We all get the letters where somebody, I added up my comics, and they add up to $86,412, and you kind of got to break the news to them that, A, the rest of the world has these comics, so you're not alone, and B, that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a extrapolation of the cover price, but a lot of other ingredients go into that called, how do I pay my rent, and all if I sell them to you for what I pay for them. But I think it's important to know that. And that's, uh, but, but back to Bob. Bob, God bless him. He is so tenacious with every little detail that he did. And even now I'm told, you know, Bob is still that same guy. You know, he just has that fastidious, fastidiousness, if that's a word I'm saying it right, that he just goes at it. And uh, what he, how, do you, how do you eat an elephant? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And Bob's been chewing on that elephant for 50 years. That's a that's a pretty it's a pretty good analogy, uh, you know. For most of us here, I know the answer to this, buddy. Did you meet Bob, and when? If so, when? No, I've never met Bob. Wow, Even now, okay. for, up, you know, for many years, I didn't have the money, and I stayed pretty much put. Uh, only in the last several years have I been doing a lot of traveling, and I still don't go to very many shows. Most of what we do is internet. Well, we. Right. I would have loved to have met him, but. Uh, I never did. We you know, it's funny you say that. You, we take things for granted. Buddy's a famous guy in the industry, Bob, and we don't know yeah. who knows who. I'll give you one of my highlights off the topic, but it was one of my favorite moments uh, at the Diamond Seminar when I had Carl Barks there in 1993, I believe it was. And it was like a thrill for everybody. And even though I had yeah. met him many times, it was even a more thrill. But I'm walking around with Carl. We had the paintings out at the Marriott Marquis. Ironically, we called it the Vertigo Hotel. Well, that's what I've got for three years now. But anyway, uh, I see in the audience rather sheepishly, and there had always been some controversy misinterpreted about the relationship or lack of one. I got to introduce Don Rosa to Carl Barks. It was one of the highlights of my career. I get goosebumps telling you that. Because I know he wanted more than anything, but he always feared it. For, he had, the, I think, the 
he thought Carl didn't like him. I don't ever think Carl didn't. There wasn't a human being that I think that Carl didn't like. Maybe somebody miscommunicated. But that was the thrill of my life to do that because here's two guys that have been so – that contributed so much to what I love, you know, and to what everybody loves. What a privilege. That's, that's one, of the, one of the great things about, about what we do and what uh, Steve Borak had mentioned about community. Uh, it's just absolutely true. Mark, did you know Bob before you came to work at Gemstone? No. <laughs> when I had my uh, first interview to talk with them, I brought a Frankenberry flicker ring. <laughs> so I thought, hey, he'd probably like that. And he was mesmerized. So it worked. But that's phenomenal. Maggie, how about you? Well, obviously, I mean, I've met Bob off and on over the years. We corresponded, we worked things out, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that we did early on uh, was uh, put in um, the information on the, the Dell uh, four colors. And so in terms of contribution to the, to the, to the project, because that was one of the things that we collected a lot and put together. So, I mean, the fact that we could then give him the information and it could be immediately incorporated was really wonderful. In person, gosh, I don't know, half a dozen times maybe in the course of things. Um, uh, I remember discussing, you mentioned the undergrounds. I remember, because we were priding ourselves on listing the undergrounds and he was going, I don't have room. To, and, and, and just the page count, the, the things that, that Mark deals with all the time. How am I going to fit this in? What's more important, that I do this or that I do that? That sort of decision we were all there making together and working out. And what could we offer that Bob didn't have and what could Bob do? Gazillions of things we couldn't do. So, um, yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure that you, you, you and Don are still in the uh, thank yous because of the, oh, yes. because of the four oh, yes. color he stuff. <laughs> yes. he's, uh, he's very, he's very, demanding that the, the certain th thanks stay in there permanently. Well, and, and, and I discovered that my loose pages of this, so that this is this is our price guide, not price guide, this is the Dell four color list. And it opens up by saying, what is the list? And then we end up with, we'll compile it ourselves, how long could it take? Because Dell said in 1961 that they didn't have a list and that we'd have to make it ourselves. And I just discovered this on my shelf that I've handwritten notes on the contents here because we were still researching it after we published it. So oh. that's that's what Mark does all day long is the, there's a typographical error on page 47, right? This is your segue, you Jeff, Jeff. This is your segue for the typos. What are you going to tell yeah, him? Yeah, you know, uh, a normal, what am I known, a normal what am editor, I known for to your detriment? <laughs> a normal editor is going to be really upset you, and you and Maggie you know how this goes you put something in print then you find it right I took about 10 years to finally just have that beaten out of me because I can hand this guy down in the bottom here Mr. Jeppy I can hand him a 1200 page book and he's going to open it to the typo yes <laughs> yes I'm cursed with yes. it yes yeah. And I'm not and, a, I'm a positive guy. It's not the negative in me. I'm not looking for it. It just jumps out. And, I and, and menus and invert my yeah. Makes me and, crazy. And and it is it is one of your many mutant abilities, Steve. <laughs> All right. Mr. Borak, how about you? When did you meet Bob? Oh boy, I think that was ninety nine when we were gonna open our competition, CGC and certification was coming. I think Bob was a little leery of certification as well. But he gave me a lot of great advice. He was so nice to me. I mean, I was, you know, awestruck. I was meeting a rock star. I mean, he's still a rock star to me. But um, he gave me great advice to be true to myself, be true to the hobby. You're going to walk a fine line. People are going to pull you in every direction. Just be true to yourself and true to the hobby. And I've tried to walk that fine line ever since. He's, I have, Bob, I have is, a... Bob is, you know, like I said, my personal hero. I had a, a recent conversation with John Snyder and he told me the only thing that in comics pricing that Bob was dogmatic about was listening to other people. And I thought that was an incredible compliment. Well, you recall back in the day and when I was blessed that we would go every year to uh, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, 
and Bob would host a advisors meeting. Now keep in mind, we didn't have the quite the number of advisors we had. There was a very small, if you go look at the indicia for the you know, front pages of the magazine, you'll see there was a reasonable number and you couldn't get everybody at once. Well, he would rent this monster chalet that was on stilts, that looking out on this beautiful Smoky Mountains. And we would just sit there and talk comics and I just absorb every little detail Occasionally, we would take a night off and go down to the Burning Bush, it was called. I'll never forget the restaurant or go to Dollywood. But by and large, that was Bob's moment to really, and if anybody was soaking up what was being said, it was Bob. He was taking his notes, and you'd see it end up happening in the subsequent guides that he listened. And that's a great quality to have, is to be a good listener. It really is, Steve. And uh, I think Bob really continues to uh, display that. I first met Bob at San Diego in 1994. Uh, I was out there on vacation from my, my then career, and I had been freelancing for uh, Bob for Overstreet Publications, and the guy who had set that up was the uh, marketing guy from Defiant, Clark Smith, and then he took me over and introduced me to Bob and Carol, uh, and Gary and uh, Lisa Carter too. And right away, I, you know, I started talking about my favorite comics to him. And as I was walking away, I said, oh, I'm just like everybody else who ever met that guy and starts telling him why he likes the comics he likes and you should be this and the guide. And I think, oh, great. I'm just one of those people now. Thank you. Uh, but he, he was, you know, super attentive, very kind and encouraging. And, uh, you know, and if, even if it wasn't his cup of tea, he could tell I was excited about it. And I think that's what Bob gets is everybody else's passion for a thing. And particularly when they demonstrate a knowledge that they really know what they're talking about, he's very eager to listen. And that's still a characteristic uh, even after doing the guide for 50 years, which is you know just amazing. All right, I'm gonna turn this to one of the things that I think is the most fun. And that's what's your favorite guide cover out of all these covers for 50 years. Steve, let's start with you. All right, I've got to recuse myself from the last 25 or six, okay? Because that wouldn't give you really quite objectivity that you'd like. And quite frankly, I'm not, no disrespect, but I, it might not be the one anyway. But I always had an affinity for number 10, the timely cover by Alex Schomburg. Sure. And if I'm not mistaken, I, I don't know how to document this. I think it was the highest selling price guy Bob ever had. Back when he had Crown selling it and it was in the bookstores, you know, uh, in those days, you know, well, they, the price was less, and people would buy it every year. Over the years, and, and more recent times, the price guide sales are not as, A, they're more expensive, but they're not, people don't feel like they need to have it every year in some cases, you know, or they buy periodically or whatever. But number 10, that Schomburg cover just was, I remember when it came in, I was a, I was beside myself. It was so pretty. <laughs> Maggie, how about you? I'm going to dodge that a little bit because to me, the contents are so much more than the cover. One thing that I might point out is that if you compare the two, maybe the important thing is where he goes from this to this. So suddenly the whole package, I mean, imagine going from saddle stitched black and white to this as a book. And people are going to know this is a book. And it's, it does what a cover needs to do. It says, here's what I am. Here's what I do. Here's why you want it. So I'm just going to be practical on that level and dodge the larger, who's my favorite artist kind of thing. I think that that's a pretty good dodge. I got to say, I'll give you some credit for that. All right, buddy, how about you? What's your favorite price guide cover? Uh, any number of them. Uh, but I think the number four, the JSA cover, because... You know, that's back when the, you know, Don Newton. all the JSA characters, all the Silver Age characters, the Golden Age, Silver Age were meeting each other. Like, you know, the Flash of Two Worlds, uh, Flash 137, I believe. Uh, that, you know, stuff like that still gives me a chill as a fan today. I mean, I can, I've that got cover. various covers stuck up uh around my computer of, of favorite, uh, pretty much DC covers. I'm a DC person more than a Marvel 
although the pre-superhero Marvel monsters were great. But anyway, the JSA cover number four, Tarzan cover number five, uh, the JLA cover number 20, oh, and the timely cover from 21. You know, and, oh, and don't forget Little Lulu, number 35, because, uh, you know, Bruce Hamilton taught me to love Little Lulu. Uh, and Maggie did, too. They were the two saying, buddy, there's more than superheroes. Love John Stanley. <laughs> more than superheroes in the world. Uh, I just wish that you guys had had a cover, and I'm sure it was because of Disney, but why there was, it hasn't been a duck cover. Well, there was one. We did a, a Disney cover, didn't it, but Jeff, with... Um... Dan, Dan Dan Yippus uh, uh, yeah. did it. And we I couldn't have missed it when I was looking was through all the ones. We wanted to get Barks earlier. to do it. It was some mitigating circumstance. Well, it should have been Barks. <laughs> well, of course, it, of course, yeah. it should have been Barks. And I think we even well, had a cover. Well, Disney. Porky Pig number eight was Barks, but it wasn't Disney. I think yeah, we, which was uh, another one I loved. I think that we Porky had the Mounties. I think we had yeah, a cover yeah. de- number eight, not number number seven. Seven, seven. I think we had cover designs from Barks for a piece that never got executed because Bob couldn't get permission. Yeah, that's what um, I figured, yeah. The, uh, yeah. He had some uh, covers that never were. And when I bought the company, we got some artwork and there was a, I want to say, was there a Kurtzman one? Uh, that was used. It was a the, rough. The, it was the a Kurtzman. The Kurtzman uh, that you had was for Overstreet's Gold and Silver Age Quarterly, number one. Yeah, we end up using it later in one of the quarterlies, yeah, but at yeah, the time like it was that. contemplated. And the Dan Yippus one, buddy, was number 34. Yes. That was the, uh, that was the Ducks one. Um, Steve? Ford? The Alfred E. Newman was with Bob on the cover in his tux. <laughs> number, number 12? 12. <laughs> That's Steve? some fun ones. Mr. Borak, what's yours? Uh, my favorite is the Bill Ward cover. Number eight, my first yes. one. Yes, it's my favorite. I was always been, um, just always dug it, thought it was really fun. Um, but like Maggie says, it's really the insides that count. Um, if the cover was blank, I'd still buy it and read through it like crazy. Now, I, before I ask Mark this same question, I, I've got to say something that Mark doesn't get acknowledged for nearly enough. And that's every year for every cover, Mark builds a custom logo. And he does a logo to fit with the cover design, with the characters. Sometimes if they've had their own book, he echoes their logo. And uh, I don't know anybody that does it better. I think there's been maybe three since he's been doing it that that actually came in Mm -hmm. where the artist did the logo. Is that about right, Mark? Yeah, about three. So what, I've done about a hundred. <laughs> so what would you? What would you? What's your favorite? I had fun doing Amanda Connor's double cover where she put Power Girl and Harley Quinn side by side. So since the hardcover image has an extra half inch on the left, the two had to join together with and without that half inch of space. So there was like some sort of rope. So it had to kind of loop, so it, it was, still matched. It was the wire for the dynamite. The dynamite was yeah, the on one side the and the plunger was on the other. Right. So I had to tweak it a little with Photoshop. And then that same year, also, uh, the Sergeant Rock cover, I got to put go-go checks on the top of the guide cover. And that gave me a thrill. I knew that every guy in his 50s or 40s who had collected <laughs> Silver Age were just putting that fist in the air saying, yeah, go-go checks, finally. That That's was what's our... great about this hobby. We got people like go go checks. We smell the paper. If somebody were listening in and heard these things, they think we all belong in the loony bin. That these kind of things were not only fun, but a lot of other people felt the same experience looking at them. You know, you know, mentioned Buddy the number four, and I, I still stick with my number 10, but I will remember this Bob did do a hardcover, very small printer of two and three, I believe, that were kind of like generic looking, you know, just a cover, not the artwork. But when number four came in, I'll never forget when the hardcover came in, that beautiful blue on the spine. Baggy mentioned, you know, from number one to number two, it became a book, but it became a paperback book at that point. But then this number four, when I'm holding that Don Newton cover and that beautiful thick spine, oh, it was just a thrill. Then I could see the print back then. <laughs> my, my, I, I have a, the challenge every year 
uh, I look at it like, you know, his first art cover was that Don Newton, number four. And then he hits with five, six, and seven, Kubert, Eisner, Barks. In Good short thought. order, in short, <laughs> yeah, in short order, Wally Wood uh, and, and Schomburg and all these guys. And nine was every, probably what, what the weird science cup? No, yeah. it was nine. Yeah. And ten every was. year, my job is to not screw it up. And I, I have had really phenomenal luck uh, when Mark and I started running the day, the day to day operations at Gemstone with number 40. Uh, we got Mark Chiarello and Darwin Cook. And we've been on a pretty good roll since then. And, you know, our goal is that it be a bucket list item for the top artists in the industry. And when I walked into Mark Chiarello's office at DC, you know, back when they were in New York, uh, and he said, oh, I'd cut off my foot to do an Overstreet cover because he's a big collector. Uh, I, I was able to say, you know, I'm very glad to have you do that, but I think negotiating is supposed to work where you tell me that afterwards. <laughs> What's great about Ch uh, Jeff, if I may embarrass him for a minute, is he's definitely, and I think we all fit this description, Kool-Aid guys, you know, we drank the Kool-Aid. There's, no there, there's no hope for us. That's the way we are. But even after 26 years of being involved in the price guide itself, he still gets, and he's a really talented creator himself and writer, he still gets goosebumps every time he either meets or tells you about meeting somebody famous that he admired. He still has that Kool-Aid approach, which I love because uh, I feel the same way. If it, it's, it's one of these things that like, you know, every job is a job or they don't pay you for it, you know? Uh, but on my worst day, I'm running a book that I grew up reading. I'm running a book that helped bring people together that set the bedrock for the secondary market that, that really was foundational for saying, hey, these are, these are prices and you can debate this price and that price and all that, but ballpark, the guide gets it right an awful lot of the time. And also, even when it's wrong, provides you the springboard to talk about it. And, and I, look at the, I look at what the San Diego Con has become and what all these other big conventions have become and and then you go back down to mom and pop little shows, you know, one day shows at a local hotel. And where would any of this be without what Bob did? And, and it's, it's not just our hobby, Jeff, it's all over. I mean, the Library of Congress, you know, Wall Street Journal, when they quote, they talk about the, and that's what I love about it. My name might be inside as the publisher or whatever the heck I'm called, but on the front, it's the, there's no getting around it. It's the Overstreet comic book price guide. And that's, that name is, uh, well, quite frankly, when I bought it, what I believed I was buying was a was the intellectual property, which was Bob's name. And quite frankly, if we did other price guides on other subjects, Bob's name would still be the name that would be from a marketing standpoint, from a branding standpoint. You can't get much better credibility than a book that stood the test of time for 50 years. And if I were doing a baseball card price guide, it would probably be the Overstreet baseball card, even though that's not Bob's you know, place, you know, per se, but that would be the, the intellectual property that I consider has the most value. Well, I want to thank all of you for participating and, and just real quick, 30 seconds a piece. Anybody have any final thoughts? Maggie? Um, I'm here for the price guide as long as the price guide's there for me. So uh, uh, absolutely endorse, shout out, represent, whatever you want to say. Thank you guys for having me here and thank you for continuing to produce it so meticulously that it's not flawed. There's not a footnote that says, oh, by the way, uh, you know, the 42nd issue wasn't really very good. It's always been top of the line. Thank you, Maggie. Steve Borak? Um, basically, I just want to thank you all for having me on the panel. This is a real honor. I mean, as a fanboy, this is just unbelievable that I get to speak about somebody as important as Bob Overstreet and the 50 years that this amazing, amazing book has been around. So once again, I'm very humbled and thank you all so much. Thank you, Steve. Buddy Saunders, how about you? Well, very few people in the comic book industry have a legacy anywhere comparable to Bob's. And it's, you know, one of my, I've had, this industry is a source of 
many, many joys for me. And the price guide and what Bob has done is part of that. And, you know, uh, I'll never forget that. Thank you very much. Mark. Oh, it was nice to spend time with everybody. And I'm looking forward to you guys seeing the final price guide when it's out there for everyone. And then we can all get together in person next year for uh, Area 51, because Bob loves the UFOs. <laughs> and we have to do something like that next year. Because <laughs> I'm sure in his eyes, 51 is probably just as important a number as 50. That's great. Steve, any last thoughts? Uh, just to say that it, um, Bob, of course, is Bob. and I, But you guys, you know, you're, don't forget every piece of this puzzle has been as important. Some are more important than others in some people's minds. But the puzzle goes together, and I'm, I'm a guy, I'm a puzzle freak, by the way. I just, I, through the COVID, I'm on my 11th puzzle right now. I love putting jigsaw puzzles together. They're my reflective time. I can do something that's got a multitasking, but I'm thinking, I got my great think time in. And when you look at our industry as a puzzle, every little piece is important. Try putting a puzzle together, and you've been looking for two hours for this one piece, and somebody's got it, doesn't even know it means anything. But when you plug it in, it's like, oh, the greatest satisfaction in the world. My only regret is that I'm not sitting there with you in person enjoying San Diego sunshine, but this is pretty cool too. Uh, thank God for Zoom. They've done a great job of bringing people together and who'd have thought how important it would be in light of what COVID did to us. But I just want to thank all of you for your support of the price guide on every level. Uh, buddy, you were there at number one. You know, it, that's pretty impressive to say. My first ad in, over, in the, the Comics Buyer's Guide, or as it was then called, TBG, The Buyer's Guide, with Alan Light number 17 so i was kind of in there early but not as early as others buddy i think you were doing this since 1961 you said so okay. i'm a, yeah 61 I'm a chump when it comes to seniority next to you <laughs> but uh you guys have been great friends and loyal supporters and it means a great deal to me i know jeff and mark and bob of course for your support so thank you for that and thanks for being on here tonight all right well I just want to say thank you to everybody for watching. We wish we could have done this in person, but we're really glad under the circumstance to be able to get together in this way. And this has been Overstreet at 50 on Comic-Con at Home.